everybody. I have a very special guest with me today, Mike White, who is host of The Projection Booth, a very awesome podcast. He's also a publisher from Cashiers Du Cinema Art, contributor for the Cinemascope, Detroit Metro Times, and has been featured in documentaries such as The People versus George Lucas. Once again, I would like to welcome Mr. Mike White. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a tape in the making. I've known about you guys for a really long time, and I just now have gotten to know you and gotten back into your guys' work and, and podcast. And I will mention the very first time that I listened to you guys, I was working, this was about two and a half summers ago, I was working uh, as ground maintenance at a resort out in Florida. And I think it was episode uh, 265 when you guys were talking about Alvira, Mistress of the Dark. That podcast was so great. It was the only thing that kept me going through four hours of straight working in the sun. Well, wow, that makes me very happy to hear. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. <laughs> of course. Um, now, as far as your guys' work has gone, what has been so far some of the highlights of your show um, from topics or guest speakers that you guys have had? Well, um, I, I think actually one of my favorite episodes is when we did the movie Near Dark, the Catherine Bigelow film, which was really interesting because I was not a fan of that movie at all, and I kind of still am not, but it was really nice to be on there with um, my co-host at the time, Rob St. Mary, who was pretty in the middle about it, and then another uh, guest co-host, Edward Pettit, who really loved that movie. And it was really, it was one of the best conversations I've ever had about a film. And it was one of these nice things where, and it's kind of uh, not necessarily something that you run across on the internet very often, where you had people of very differing opinions actually sitting there listening to each other, making points and going back and forth. And at the end of the day, I think we were all very happy and we had had a really nice conversation. You mentioned that one of your favorite horror movies is Evil Dead 2. Yes. Okay. Well, here's the big question. What did you think of the Evil Dead remake that came out in the past few years? I wasn't that big of a fan of it. I mean, I really like that the original Evil Dead can still scare the heck out of me. Like, it's so creepy still, even though the effects are pretty rudimentary and all these kind of things. And there's some really jokey moments to it but then the sequel is what really does it for me that they can take that kind of bad production value stuff amp it up make it look really good and then add the comedy to it and i just love the mix of the three stooges style humor with that gore and everything i think it's one of the best horror comedies that i've ever seen oh yeah bruce i to me any work that that he's in I'm all for it. Like, Bruce Campbell is one of my favorite horror comedic actors. So anything he has been in from indie films to well-known movies, like, such as Evil Dead, I'm all for it. Like, I've not had the pleasure of meeting him, but I know a friend of mine has. And he told me that he has <laughs> – he gives you such a wonderful, warm stage presence that you can't help but love the guy, even though in your mind some people – when you when you want to when you want to go up and shake his hand, the first thing that comes to your mind is him saying "groovy," you know, like that's his staple in a way. I have heard so many great stories about him. I remember a few years ago for "My Name Is Bruce," they had a screening of that up in Toronto for the Toronto Film Festival at the uh, Midnight Madness program, and a friend of mine runs that program or ran it at the time, and he said that Bruce stayed there until. I think it was four o'clock in the morning standing outside on uh, I think it's on Young Street with all the fans and made sure that every single fan had had their due and had had an opportunity to talk to him before he ended up going back to the hotel so that he took uh, like an extra two hours to make sure everybody was satisfied. That is so see now that's when you know that you have a love for your film and your work and you have a love for your fans. Have you ever had the uh, the pleasure of watching him in uh, Bubba Hotep? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there have been a lot of movies where I'll rent it, even if he's just in it for a few seconds. Or maybe he's, you know, not that proud of the work, you know, something like a moon trap. But, I mean, I love him in something like Congo, where he's just in there for a hot second, but he's fantastic. <laughs> exactly. 
Now, one one thing that caught my eye is <clears throat> his ability to be able to play uh, an Elvis-like character. And the reason I brought that up is because one of your work histories is you've done the Elvis, uh, I believe it was the Elvis Impersonators uh, show, or it had some of the lines of like, I read it a long time ago. I made a documentary when I was in college about a Elvis impersonator or Elvis tribute artist here in the Metro Detroit area named Sherman Arnold, who at that point had actually been performing as Elvis longer than Elvis was alive. And he put on such an amazing show, and I had the pleasure of coming out and recording several of his shows, and I really went out, went all out. It was supposed to be just basically like a little five-minute documentary. I ended up doing this whole 20-minute thing. I shot it on Super 8. I recorded it on this Nagra, um, and then I did sync sound, laid it into video, and synced it all up and everything, and did all this editing in video. And yeah, apparently Sherman sent it to the, and this is a thing, the Elvis Impersonators Hall of Fame. So it's somewhere in their archives now. So that makes me super proud. I am definitely going to have to check that out sometime. I know out here in Vegas, whenever, anytime anybody mentions Elvis and you say you work, uh, you work in showbiz, they're thinking either you're a impersonator doing a live show or you're out on Fremont impersonating Elvis, but but one of the best shows I think I've ever seen was uh, the Elvis tribute show over here at the Four Queens on Fremont, and it's got amazing reviews. So uh, even if you're if you're coming out to Vegas, I would definitely definitely recommend checking that out. It was fantastic, very cheap price. I mean, awesome layout, awesome costume and set design, and he even stands outside and will take pictures with you know people and fans for free. It's amazing. One of my happiest memories that I have is taking one of my relatives who is a huge Elvis fan. She's probably 66 years old or something now and loved Elvis when he was around. And we took her to a tribute show at a local um, like uh, Italian place where they have a theater and stuff and took her in there. And she was just so enamored of this impersonator. It's hilarious. Just at one point he came by and shook her hand and then at one point he's just like i gotta have my hand back darling you know just she was just like wouldn't let go of him she was so enamored <laughs> it was great oh yeah some of these people they they put their heart into their performance and not just not just any like elvis uh person here but anybody who's impersonating or carrying on the legacy of a great performer and i have yet to see somebody do bruce campbell correctly though now one thing i wanted to move into is that you You've actually, you're, you're more than just a podcaster and you've done, you know, you talk more than just about pop culture and, and cinema that your guys' podcast has brought me back into is like the preservation and awareness and respect of very old movies, especially of VHS, what I grew up with, you know, pre-DVD era. And that's something I have a huge respect for. And your guys' podcast is more of a retrospective. So taking you back a bit, what has been one of the, your favorite VHS covers that you can remember seeing growing up? Oh, gosh. Uh, the first one that springs to mind is the Black Roses cover. That whole idea of it being like 3D. And then, of course, the Frankenhooker cover with the uh, the sound with the, want a date? <laughs> oh, I do not. I don't remember that, but I do remember. God, I remember somebody was selling these uh, vintage um, these VHS tapes. But the covers were completely done around, and they were made. You bought them in a in a multi pack, and they were made to put you in like this uh, this real life effect. As like uh, if you bought like say the Blob on VHS, then the cover would come with an actual sticky like pink substance. I don't remember who was selling it, but I do remember seeing those out, and I wish I kicked myself in the ass for not buying those up when I had the chance. I think I remember that Blob one. I want to say it was like the Blob remake, the '90s remake of it. Maybe. I mean, because it came in a pack, but there was a few other uh, old school ones with it. So they might have mixed and matched it, but I just thought that that take was so, so ingenious and so brilliant that you could hold something and it would have the real life almost material of whatever movie, horror movie that you were holding. Uh, I, I mean, I just so cool what they did with it. Now, you also are co-host of the uh, Cold Check tape and uh, Dreams for Sale, The Twilight Zone. Now, can you tell me and the viewers more about your other podcast and what your role is? 
Well, yeah, as uh, co-host of the Cold Chat Tapes, it's my friend Chris Dashu and I, and every month we talk about an episode either of the original Night Stalker show, which was in 1974, or we'll talk about the uh, reboot that happened in 2005 going into 2006, and we kind of mix and match. We'll do two of the originals, one of the newer one, back to two of the originals. And I think we kind of somehow figured out the math so that we will probably be ending up at a pretty good point. We actually discussed the penultimate ver uh, episode of the 2005 uh, Kolchak or Night Stalker just last month, and then we'll be back to the original. And then I think we have one more uh uh, 2005 one, and then we have to talk about an episode of the X Files, which actually used a rejected script from Kolchak. But yeah, we pretty much try to talk about that show from '74 because it was so influential on so many things: X Files, Supernatural, um, you know, so so many detective, supernatural detective kind of things. I mean, every once in a while, I'll throw in like. Well, you know, Scooby-Doo was kind of doing it first, but the show really took it to another level. And then with Dreams for Sale, I am one of three people. So it's, again, Chris Dashu and then our friend Father Malone. And the three of us talk about the 1980s incarnation of The Twilight Zone. Started in 85, I want to say it ended in 88. We just started that recently, so we're only about six episodes in. And... We've got a long road to hoe with that one. Um, but yeah, every month we we talk about another episode of that show. And um, it started off really strong. We're kind of getting some uh, bad episodes, but I know there's some other gems along the way. How is your guys' outlook for the uh, new reboot of The Twilight Zone? Uh, that's, uh, I think it's narrated by Jordan Peele. Yeah, we actually did a bonus episode and talked about that. And they had, they released two episodes right off the bat. And we weren't really super keen on either one of those. And then actually I watched the third episode just recently. And I really think they would have done themselves a better service to start with the third episode rather than the one that they started with. Because that third episode was really strong. And I want to actually talk with my co-hosts and maybe we'll kind of do like a two for one and do old and new as we go along. I mean, I remember watching that um, as a kid because I was exposed very young to things like this by my mother. And when I would go live with my dad, we, we would always just like junk out on old VHS movies. And whenever I knew um, that someone like Vincent Price was going to be on something, I definitely I would either rent it. I would steal it offline. I, I hate to say it, but I would or, you know, I would go out and watch it because I had such a respect for that era. And such a respect for that for production back then and being somebody who has studied tv and film production and editing and all of that it's amazing how far somebody has come in not just building a legacy in hollywood but also the the transmedia effect of it as you know coming into a new age now what is your what is your thoughts and theories of that are you more of an old school person or do you kind of like to mix and match like uh the, the FX features with like the 3D sort of stuff. Oh, I'm fine with anything. I mean, I enjoy that era of cinema where they were trying to take people back from the TV screen back into the cinema. And so they were trying a lot of different, you know, techniques and schlocky stuff or breaking new ground when it came to things like 3D or, you know, Vista Vision, those kind of things. So I always enjoy just looking at the history of cinema and it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm only into this era or this gimmick or whatever. But, you know, even as we go along, like I'm very curious to see how all this stuff shakes out when it comes to, you know, Netflix distribution versus theatrical distribution versus possibly something else. I mean, things that we thought were set in stone in the 1960s, changed radically in the 1970s, changed radically in the 1980s. I mean, nobody who was making movies in 1974 saw Jaws around the corner, and that changed the way that movies were seen. You know, things that would open wide, you know, open across the country versus opening in a few select theaters and then moving around and staying around forever. 
I mean, now you're lucky if you can catch a movie at the movie theater before it moves into VOD or something else. I mean, people were screaming their heads off a few years ago when Soderbergh released, I think it was Bubble, both on VOD and at the theater on the same day. And now it's like so commonplace. I'm a huge uh, advocate for drive-ins. So anytime there's a drive-in available or open to me, I don't care if I have to drive 30 minutes or three hours, I'm going to find it and hit it up. And I think that that's, that's more also where that comes into the respect of, of cinema and those, those changing landscapes that you had discussed is, is that there's this, this weird preservation to keep cinema alive and teaching your children and your children's children about these films. But when I think it's harder to do when it's a changing platform and, and it's not the same as, you know, walking. I remember walking through Blockbuster at like six and seven years old, you know, and buying like the bag of popcorn and taking it to the front and giving them my card and walking out. But it wouldn't be the same as far as, you know, somebody my, my age or younger. So they can go on their phone and they can go stream the newest movie, you know, from from their smart TV. I just don't think it's that same. It's, it's You're not going to get that same feeling. Right. And that stuff that we're nostalgic for, I mean, people 10 years older, 20 years older, probably didn't have that same experience. So, or, you know, it, it's, it changes every generation. I just don't think we like to admit that. Maybe actually this, this reverts back to VHS tapes is uh, Scotch's VHS. They had a commercial and I want to say it was in the late eighties. It had a dancing skeleton. It was like paraphrasing this song and it uh, was was basically telling you about uh, re-recording and never fading away. Huh. You're like, um, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. You know, you're going to get a lifetime guarantee. Take what you want both night and day and re-record, not fade away. I don't know if you remember that. I don't. <laughs> but it sounds like a pretty catchy tune. I believe it's like a clay animation style. Like, I binge watch very old like commercials and tv episodes around the holidays like halloween just to get me in the spirit and i'll catch a old pre-recorded commercial from like the 80s or 90s and it'll just take me back to like oh god i remember that or oh i wish i was there for that moment do you have any memories like that oh yeah yeah i mean i still have some old vhs tapes kicking around um i used to just man it was kind of sad just how often i was taping tv shows or would wait around for certain videos and would record those off of MTV and basically make like VHS mixtapes. And yeah, it was uh, not necessarily the commercials too often, which I'm kind of sad for because there are still commercials that just stay with me today. And then um, there's still commercials that I will quote all the time. And unless you happen to have grown up with me, you probably <laughs> <laughs> don't know those commercials if you're in detroit in the 80s and 90s you know you probably just don't even know what like highland appliances or ollie fretters these kind of things but they were classic commercials for me and you know i like you i will go out on youtube and be like oh i wonder if they have that you know the electronic thing sale or in my wife is the same way my wife's 10 years older than me and she was talking with a friend of hers and one of them just blurted out crazy lady pantyhose. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And I was like, oh, it was a, it was a commercial. I can't remember what it was for. Thank God for Google. I was able to Google crazy lady pantyhose and find this uh, Buff Whalen uh, car commercial. And sure enough, there was this nutty lady who was trying to uh, win a contest, or at least she thought that's what it was. And she just started spewing out all these phrases and crazy lady pantyhose was part of it. Especially my favorite is when you're watching uh, local uh, local television. You're all the way in Orlando, and you're watching a commercial that's aired in, like, Canada. You're like, wow, they can do that on TV? Like, hell yeah, they just did that on TV. Like, uh, it brought me to a, a Corey, um, a Corey Haim film, because I'm a big uh, Corey Haim fan, you know, rest his soul and all. But <laughs> he did a movie called uh, Just, I believe it was, like, Just One of the Girls. Um, American version. I think it's called something else in Canada, but they actually showed, you know, breasts of young girls in a locker room, and it's geared towards teenagers, and it's really PG-13, but here in America, that would not fly if you're talking about naked teenagers and having it rated PG-13. I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, WNUF Halloween special, but oh, yeah, the way that they will do the fake 
uh, cable commercials are just perfect. They just, there's so many of them are like, yep, I remember exactly that type of spot running in my local origination. Oh man, thank you for that walk down memory lane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> moving in, uh, moving on to something I want to mention is a book um, that you are an author of called Impossibly Funky, a Cashier's Du Cinemark Collection. Can you explain a little bit more about that book and where it stands in your, your line of work and the art represented in it? Well, yeah, I uh, after I graduated from college, it was right around the time that zines were a bigger thing. I mean, I know zines had been around for ages, but things like Fact Sheet 5, which was a magazine that was dedicated specifically to zines and connecting zinesters, that was pretty popular at the time or as popular as that could possibly be. Um, and I was really into the idea of trading people for zines, but I had nothing to trade. At the same time, I'm working at a kind of a shitty job, a lot of overnight shifts. So I'm like, well, I've got not a whole lot of things to do on this overnight shift. Add that to me just graduating from college where I loved writing about films. Voila, here is me producing a zine when I'm, you know, 22 years old, something like that, and did that from 94 to, gosh, I don't know, I want to say like 2010, and then went ahead and did a couple after that that aren't necessarily reflected in the Impossibly Funky book, and at one point I decided, oh, let's take the best bits of the zine that I, I had worked on for all these years. And that's not just me. That's so many people that I worked with over the years, because after a while people would ask, you know, can I write for you? Or I would ask them, can you write for me? And so it was me. It was, uh, I think I, at least like eight or 10 other people wrote pieces for this, or I, I called those together. And then it also gave me a chance to revisit a lot of things because as I'm writing, I'm definitely obsessive about certain things. Uh, the film Black Shampoo, Star Wars, uh, Quentin Tarantino, you know, the Planet of the Apes, certain topics. And so when it came to this, I was able to take all those things, put them together, and actually update some stuff along the way. So that's why on the cover it boasts 13.2% uh, uh, new material. So that, you know, I wanted to give people something that they hadn't necessarily read before and then package it up really nice. My friend Lori uh, Higgins packaged it all up, uh, did all the proofing and the layout and everything, and voila, we were able to put that out through Bear Manor Media back in, I want to say it was 2011. <laughs> I mean, I just really enjoy writing about different things. I mean, one of the last, um, I, I took part in a uh, book called Get That Cat Out of Here, where I was asked, you know, can you write about uh, a couple movies? And I chose from this long list. And it was really nice to be able to revisit some things that I hadn't seen in a long time and then actually speak to some of the people that were involved. It, after doing the podcast for so many years, I've learned finally how to reach out to people and speak to the actual people that were involved in things. So rather than me just wondering, oh, I wonder why they did this this way or they did that that way, I'm actually able to say, like, yeah, I'm writing about Airplane 2. Let's see if uh, Robert Hayes is available. Let's see if the guy who directed it is available and able to reach out to all these people and actually get responses and find out the inside scoop on this stuff. So that's really helped. The, the world of the writing and the podcast have come together in that way. Um, and then, you know, there are other times I'm very obsessive about things. So like I wrote a, an article for uh, Paris Cinema magazine a few years ago, and it was just me looking at my video shelves going, I've got a lot of movies about talking genitals. I really want to write a piece that is the definitive article about talking genitals in film. And then between the movies that I had and then looking things up, I was able to put together a pretty comprehensive article all about how genitals uh, talk in films. I don't say that we try to take stuff too seriously, but we try not to be like, chuckleheads when we're talking about stuff and just laugh at movies we try to laugh more with them 
Um, so, and I actually find myself because I have, uh, as you've experienced in our conversation, I have uh, the the laugh of a uh, a mule in heat. So I definitely I cut my own laugh out quite a bit. If you listen to me just ramble on on these episodes to think that I actually cut out a lot of myself, you're probably like, oh my god, it must be hell to record one of these things with this guy. And some days are better than others, and I think I speak for not, not just me and you, but any anybody who does podcasting or journalism, it can get tiring, and some days you're just not on your game for whatever reason, and some days you're you're 100% ready to go, and you just kind of have to take it as, it as it goes, whether it's just you doing it or a guest, and yes, there has been times where I've had, had to cut myself out of things quite a bit, and I'm like, oh, geez, why would I say that, or why would I pause like that, but you know, it's just, you can't, you can't always prepare for everything, and people will love you either way, and I've gotten feedback from people that say, I love what you do because it's more raw and it's more real, and I used to hate when I would have to laugh on air or laugh in my mic, and then I decided to keep it because people said it was more genuine when you left sometimes in the oopses and the, the laughs. I think it also helps me feel like I have a drier sense of humor if I can say something fairly outrageous and then cut the laugh out afterwards it makes it sound like either I'm oblivious to me saying something funny or that I have a super dry sense of humor I know that actually I've gotten feedback before of people saying sometimes Mike says outrageous things and I don't know why he would choose to do that but sometimes I'll just say things sometimes it's just to provoke a reaction because when you're talking about a film, sometimes you want to just say like, well, what if it's, what if the opposite is true? What if we're talking about this and the opposite of all this stuff is the thing that we want to you know, talk about? Or what if this is all a metaphor for something else? And I'll just throw that out there. And then, you know, it's not like I'm sabotaging my guests, but it's just like, hey, what, what if we think about it this way instead? So I, I necessarily, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it holds people up in a different uh, different light. Um, as long as you carry, you know, proper mannerisms with you and you keep true to your uh, your origin, you know, your storytelling style, I think there'll be more people that come around and respect you, you know, regardless of the people who don't necessarily get it. Hopefully. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, fingers crossed. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you're going to be doing a list of appearances coming up. Well, um, in early May, I'll be going out to the Nitrate Film Festival. And mostly I'll just be covering that. I don't think I'll be, you know, doing any sort of Q&As or anything like that. But I'll be talking with the festival director and uh, getting more information about the festival. Because they don't tend to announce the films until the day of the festival. And they like to keep things kind of under uh, their vests. Um, but then when I do this, I'll be able to say more about what's going on because it's, it's a fantastic festival. It happens every year in Rochester, New York at the George Eastman house, and they show original nitrate prints, um, in theatrically shown, of course, on their equipment and they are known for their film preservation. So it, I'm really looking forward to this because I've only talked to, the uh, director of the festival, I've never gone to it until this year, so I'm really looking forward to that. Do you ever do one-on-one uh, -on -one meet and greets with people, just to, like with their fans, or just collaborative meetings at these at these events, or is this more of like a personal thing for you? This is more of a personal thing for me. I don't think that anybody would show up if I did some sort of like a meet and greet kind of thing, so I, I just don't think I could take the rejection of no one being there. Oh, Wow, I'm sorry. Did I hit a soft spot, Mike? It's okay. I, I know that nobody likes me. I might as well eat worms. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, if you were to be a tree, what kind of tree would you be? <laughs> a tree? That is a hard question to ask because I have allergies, Mike. I'm allergic to a lot of things. I love trees, but I might die because of it one day. <laughs> uh, I'm not not sure what the tree is called, but it's the the Japanese blossom trees, cherry blossom. Sounds very beautiful. What what brought that to your mind? Oh, that's just a famous question that Barbara Walters used to ask at least one of her guests. I'm not sure if she always asked that. Yeah, 
well, I never watched her, so I was not familiar with that. What type of tree would you be? I thought that was more of like a uh, metaphor for something else coming. <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on today. I'm sorry that we didn't have uh, as long a time as I wanted, but I got a, definitely an ear and a mouthful. So thank you so much. Well, thanks again for having me on. I appreciate this. Absolutely. And I would love to have you you know, back on sometime. Fantastic. Anytime. Well, once again, this is Spooky Gals Corner, and uh, I will give you guys all the information you need in our links below to keep in contact with us. And as always, stay spooky. You want to give a send off to the people? Thanks for listening. Sorry if I rambled on too much. <laughs> well, you heard it straight from his mouth, everybody. Thanks for listening. Take what you want both night and day. Then re record, not fade away. Re record, not fade away. Re record, not fade away. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. It's so fuzzy here. What I.